Old Testament story in Genesis chapter 29, verses 9 through 30. I would pray that you will indulge me to read this in your reading. The length of the reading of the scripture this morning is not an indication of the length of the sermon. So I want you to stay with me today. Genesis 29, verse 9. This is how my Bible reads. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. Now as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the whale's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Jacob told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel. And he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife that I may go into her for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob and he went into her. Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what is this that you've done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, it is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn complete the week of this one. And we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so. And completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his female servant Bilia to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob went in to Rachel also. And he loved Rachel more than Leah. And he served Laban another seven years. I want to talk about with the Lord's help in your prayers. I don't mind working. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't mind working. Church, October the 2nd, 1967, Martin Luther King, poet, preacher, shining leader of the civil rights movement and spokesman was speaking to a group of students at Barrett Junior High School of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. In his princely yet Southern tone and demeanor, he said these words, if it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, Sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets like Leonte Price sings before the Metropolitan Opera, like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well, the heavenly host of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job so well if you can't be a pine on a hill be a shrub in the valley be the best little shrub if you can't be a highway be a trail if you can't be the sun be the star for it isn't by the size you win or fail be the best at whatever you can be 
That's all Dr. King was trying to say. He was trying to encourage those young people simply whatever that lot you find yourself in, simply do your best. Those words are just as potent today as they were in 1967. Those words are just not for a group of adolescents who sat in an academic space in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Those words are just as essential today for those of us who find ourselves in the workforce or domestic workers in our home. The word is no matter what you do, do your best. Life has to be more than you simply going to a job, going through the routine of day in and day out labor, waiting for your weekly or bi-weekly compensation. Life has to be more than just getting just enough to get by. Life has to be more than laundry and cooking dinner and laundry and cooking dinner and cleaning house. Listen, we have the opportunity opportunity for the light of Christ to be illuminated in our lives, not simply in the sanctuary, but also in the workplace. After all, you don't spend all of your time in the sanctuary. You spend over 40 hours a week on your job. Over 40 hours in your house working, listen, serving God is not regulated to sacred space. At 1821 Edmond Street, we have the opportunity to serve God in wherever place we are, especially in the marketplace of life. We serve God. We show off the testimony of what it means to be connected to God at work. Here in our text, we have an impeccable picture of work ethic at its finest. We find Jacob. Jacob is a field hand out in the desert. And while he's out working, he experiences love at first sight. While he's working, church, he sees a beautiful girl by the name of Rachel. And when he sees her, he kisses her in the mouth. He says, oh my, that's my queen. Love at first sight church. And Rachel runs and tells her father Laban. And we're introduced to Laban. And Laban and Jacob have a negotiation. They are negotiating this young girl's Rachel's destiny between two men. And they strike a deal. Jacob, if you work for me for seven years, you can have my baby daughter. That's how it was then. He worked seven years. And the story tells us seven years didn't feel that long because he was hoping to hold in his hand what he saw with his eyes. You know, when you want something so bad, the work doesn't seem that feverish. It doesn't seem that tedious. He works day in and day out. And finally, at the completion of seven years, he declares, today is my day. I've put in my time. I'm ready for my wife. He's full of ecstasy and full of erotic desire. And Laban said, okay, let's have a celebration. There's lamb, there's cow, there's wine and drink of every kind. They're having an all-out celebration. And Jacob is so full of ecstasy, and his bride is veiled. He has had so much food and drink that his equilibrium has become disturbed. His tongue is stammering. His steps are inconsistent. And finally, he stumbles 
in the room. He does not peek under the veil. The liquid courage has overtaken him. And he lays down in the bed without looking under the veil. And soon as the morning sun began to pierce the clouds, it is not Rachel, it's Leah. And he screamed in the words of Charlie Dayton says, this is not what I ordered. Have you ever been there? You've worked so hard. You work so feverishly for something, and once you get it in your hand, you say, this is not it. Can you imagine? Jacob stumbles, drops to his feet. This is not Leah. This is not Rachel. This is Leah. Yes, Leah's cute, but she's not Rachel. It's like going to the steakhouse. There's nothing wrong with a T-bone, but when your tongue is ready for a ribeye, there is a difference. Go into the room and Laban tries to explain, say, it's not right for me to give my baby over the older. He says, I tell you what, stay with her this week. See if you like it. If you don't like it, work seven more years and I'll give you Rachel. In essence, he agreed and said, I don't mind working. That leads us to our take home truth this morning. God gives us assigned work for more than our personal advancement. This is the deed to do. Engage in assigned work with the awareness that it is an opportunity for God to receive honor and glory for what we do. Engage in assigned work with the awareness that it's an opportunity for God to receive honor and glory from what we do. This is the first thing we learn from this little story is this. We can always decide the type of work we do. That's a reality, church. Jacob is engaged in agricultural labor, yet the type of work he's engaged in is a sidebar comparative to the positive attitude he possessed. Church, many of us will work in factories, and that's fine. You'll work in factory putting together a piece of a larger whole. You'll find yourself on some conveyor belt putting the pieces of something together. Some of us will work in our homes for our families, ensuring the efficiency of a home and ensuring that our children are raised with the most important life skills that they need to ensure that the majority breadwinner can work with efficiency and provide for the family. Other of us will work in firms for hospitals and law firms and fortune 500 companies some of us like our foreparents will have to work on a farm with the beast of the field and our hands will be given over to what comes out of the ground but no matter what you do we all have to work many of us we were trained in one field Many of us, we have degrees in a certain field. We have certification, but life and circumstances has forced us to work in a different and sometimes difficult area. Listen, we always don't get the chance to choose where we work. You have a degree in finance, and now you're working in customer service. You have a degree in uh, business administration, and maybe you're working uh, in the hospitality field. You don't always get a chance to choose where you work. Sometimes life chooses that for you. And Paul reminds us that work is necessary when he warned the believers at the church at Thessalonica in 2 Thessalonians 3 and 10. He says, if a man doesn't work, he does not eat. Lean in, church. Many of us, transformation and success is always eluding us and getting away from us because we are scared of work. And let me tell you, church, 
success is always tied to perspiration. You can't get ahead in life being afraid of work. That's a word for some of my parents this morning. You got grown folk living in your house that won't get a job and you are walking on eggshells in your house. They eating your eggs, your bacon, your cheese, and they won't work for anybody. All able-bodied people ought to be working. Talk back to me if you can. All able-bodied people, you can't play PlayStation every day. You can't stay on Facebook all day. You ain't that fine. You ain't that cool, cute. You ain't that buff where you don't have to work. The word for sister, soon your beauty shall fade. You ought to have a skill. Have something to bring to the table more than lips and hips. <laughs> Working in some form to pay or to create efficiency for your household is as a fundamental part of our existence. <clears throat> However, there is something that is much more important than your compensation. <coughs> there is something that is much more important than the perks that you negotiate in your package. There's something much more important than the corner office or the preferred cubicle in your workspace. What we become when we are engaged in our work is more important than the work we do. You miss that? Who are you all? Who are you when you work? What's your attitude? What's your temperament? What's your character when you work? Who do you represent on the job? So often we spend all of our time climbing the ladder of success, shattering the glass ceiling of sexism and classism, and we finally get our corner office. But the question is, at what cost? Have you traded in your character for compensation? Have you traded in your faithfulness to God for fleeting fame? Have you traded in a peace of mind for a little 10 cent promotion? The Bible tells us this. What profits a man to gain the whole wide world and to lose his soul? Lean in church no matter what you're doing and what work you are engaged in. It's an opportunity for God's light to shine through your life. and what we work for. The love story of Jacob and Rachel is littered with labor law issues. Just think about it. Jacob had to work for 14 years when he had a contract that said he only had to work for seven. So this is the question, what was his work environment? Did he get all the bad tasks because Laban knew that he wanted Rachel so bad that he gave him all the hard tasks because he knew Jacob would do it? Was there an EEOC for Jacob to go and talk to? Was there a union that would protect his rights as an employee? Probably not. It was slim. There were some things that Jacob could not control, but there were two things that he could control, and this was this. In the manner he worked, so he worked willfully. Listen, Jacob was not made to work for Laban. Lean in, child of God, no matter where you work and even in, if the conditions are cruel, nobody has made you to work that job so you can't go to work every day with an attitude because you chose the job. 
You ought to work willfully. You ought not come to work with an attitude that you just ought to be happy that I'm here. Can God get any glory out of that? They didn't make you apply for the job. They didn't tell you to send in your resume, your resume. You just ought to work willfully. But then, this is the second thing. You ought to work diligently. Let the, let the church say diligently. It's not that you work, but how do you work? What's your attitude? What's your temperament? Do you go in and give your best? Or, 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 or are you always looking for a shortcut? Diligently. Are you giving your best? Do you exceed the expectations? Or do you just give enough to get by? Can God get any glory out of that? When you wear a New Hope t-shirt, say, I go to New Hope Baptist Church. <laughs> and you wear your what would Jesus do bracelet. And you run around the job talking about I'm blessed. And I won't be stressed. Can God get glory out of that? It is clear that there was a focus to Jacob's work. It was his beloved Rachel. Lean in, church. He, he, he had some motivation. He had tasted the sweet nectar from Rachel's lips. He had saw her alluring shape. It's right there in the Bible. That was Jacob's motivation for getting up day in and day out. That's what made him work 168 months and 5,110 days. That's what made him get up every morning. And this is my question. What's your focus? What's your motivation for your work? Because church, if you don't have any focus or motivation when you go to work, your job will always be a dead-end job. You won't ever be satisfied. You won't ever be happy. It will always be a dread and a drudge for you. You have to have some focus and some motivation. Why do you get up and take care of your children every day? Why do you maintain a household and choose to be a domestic worker? What's your motivation? By the way we work. I'm done today. We experience transformation when we fully realize and live out our existence knowing that whatever we do, there's the potential for God to get glory out of our lives. Matthew 5. I have Bible on my side. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Who lights a candle and put it under a bushel? Then the text moves and says this, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. How can God get glory out of your life on your job? How can God get glory out of what you do in the church? I tell you there are two ways that God can get glory when you make people a priority. Oh, I know that's, that's, that's anti our whole world existence. Everybody says, put yourself first. All of us in some form or fashion, we are plagued with drum major instinct. We always want to be the star. But this is the question. Do you just use people as a means to an end? And listen, what is your ethic behind how you make your money? Are you willing to do anything to get a little money so you can move in a different neighborhood? Are you willing to take deals under the table and sell your people out just so you can get a new car, just so you can get away from your cousins and them and walk around with your nose up in the air? If it rains, you will drown. Is that your attitude? But whatever you do, it ought to be some ethics behind how you make money. You can't be satisfied in heaven when your brother is living in hell every day. why the psalmist says this. If I can help somebody as I travel along this way, 
then my living won't be in vain. If I can help somebody with a word or a song, then my living won't be in vain. It has to be more to your life than a little $2 check and a 401k and a few stocks and bonds. But finally, God is glorified in our work when excellence is the standard. Let the church say excellence. Jacob worked hard. He, he worked feverishly. Excellent. Are you the type of person that comes late? Leaves early? Take an extended lunch all of the time? Doing just enough to get by? Do you never exceed anybody's expectations? You just go along to get along. Do you bring any new, fresh insights to the table? If you work in church, do you use church as you'll do the stuff at church that you'll never do on your job? Do, do you just get by? And I tell you this, God expects our best in everything we do. Hebrews says, one brother bought a more excellent sacrifice than another. Can I tell you something? God does not even look at our work when it's not our best. And this is the question today. If God evaluated your work, what would the findings be? If God was giving you your evaluation on your job, how would it look? Listen, church, all I came to tell you is this. God deserves our best. God deserves your best in your creativity, in your preparation, in your execution, in your collaboration. God always deserves our best because it sets the stage for the light of his glory to be seen. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, God deserves your best. God deserves your best because God is always giving his best to us time and time again. And when I'm on my job, I want somebody to say, that's a child of the king. When I'm in the break room, I want somebody to say, that's a daughter or a son of the New Hope Baptist Church because they give their best. I'm done today. You ought not mind working. Because we serve a God who doesn't mind working. You don't believe me today, church. God was working in the beginning of time. He was working when he carpeted the earth with grass, tacked it down with roses and dandelions. God was working. God was working when he sculpted the mountains and scooped out the ocean. God was working. God was working when he created all types of hues and personalities and nationalities all at one time. God is a working God. But he just didn't stop there while he was working outside of the earth. He decided, I just won't work from the outside, but I'm willing to step on the inside. And he boarded the train of a virgin, and that train ran for nine months, and he got off in Bethlehem, and he found himself working with his hands as a carpenter, putting things together. But he didn't stop there. He was working as a life coach for 12 days disciples. He worked uh, as a lifeguard when Peter was drowning uh, in a raging uh, Galilean sea. Uh, he worked as a psychiatrist when the demon-possessed man uh, was filled uh, with satanic forces. Uh, he worked as an obstetrician uh, for the woman who had an issue of blood uh, for 12 uh, long years. Uh, he worked as a social worker on Mount Calvary when he said, Woman, uh, behold thou son, uh, and son, uh, behold Hold thy mother. He kept on working. They put nails in his hands. And he opened up the doors of the church. And he said, whosoever will, let him come. But he kept on working. They put nails in his feet. And it built the foundation of our faith. And when they lifted up that cross, he said, whosoever will, let him come. And I tell you what I did. I came to Jesus. Just 
just as I was. I was weary. Will you talk back to me? I was weary, wounded and sad, but I found in him a sweet old resting place, and he has made me glad. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, I serve a God that don't mind working, and he kept on working up on that soul of mine. He kept on working at the age of five years old. I tell you what I did. I came to Jesus. Just as I was, I was weary, wounded and sad. But I tell you what I did. I found in him a sweet old resting place. And while I'm down here, I tell you what I say. Work on me, Jesus. I don't mind. Work on my mouth so I can talk right. Work on my legs so I can walk right. Work on my mind so I can and think right. Uh, shake somebody's hand uh, and say, neighbor, uh, let them work on you. Uh, and let me tell you, uh, it might be dark uh, in your life, uh, but I serve a God uh, that works well uh, on the night shift. Uh, shake somebody's hand uh, and say, neighbor, oh, neighbor, I know it might be hard, but tell them, hold on. I said, hold on, hold on. Just a little while longer. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy, I said, joy, joy is coming in the morning. So because God is working on me, I don't mind working for him. Shake two people's hand and tell them I don't mind working for the Lord. I'm out of here, new hope. I once was a lonely island. I was a sinner too. I, I heard a voice from heaven saying there is work to do. I, I took uh, my master's hand uh, and I joined uh, the Christian band. Uh, I, 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 I'm on uh, the battlefield uh, for my Lord. Uh, look at somebody uh, and say, neighbor, oh, neighbor. I don't mind working, and I'm going to work until my change comes. I'm going to work until he bless my family. I'm going to work until he turn my situation around. Work on me, Jesus. I said, work on me, Jesus. Work on me, Jesus. I don't mind. 